what are you trying to fill by shopping and how can you fulfill it some other way? Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is all about decluttering, getting to the emotional roots of our clutter, top tips for how to start decluttering and organizing your home, and how to be more intentional about bringing stuff into your home. Our guest today is Tracy McCubbin. Tracy is a decluttering expert and the author of Making Space Clutter Free, the last book on decluttering you'll ever need. And her latest book, Make Space for Happiness, How to stop attracting clutter and start magnetizing the life you want. She has always referred to herself as obsessive compulsive delightful, but who knew she could turn that trait into a booming business. As the CEO of Declutterfly, Tracy has helped thousands of clients clear the clutter in their lives to create space for positive life changes. So before we begin today, I just want to let you guys know that we just launched the new 2023 Artist of Life workbook on our shop. The Artist of Life workbook is our top selling guided journal to help you create your most intentional and successful year. So you can check it out at shop.lavendare.com. All right, on to the interview. Hello, Tracy. Welcome to the Lavendare Lifestyle Podcast. How are you doing? I'm so good, Eileen. It's so lovely to meet you. I know. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. You're here to help us declutter our lives, give us all the tips. I I need this personally, and I I actually did plan to declutter this weekend. So I want to talk about clutter first. Why does it happen, and how do we get to the root of our clutter? Eileen, that's such a great question. So at the basis and the part that so many people don't realize is that our clutter is really about our emotional attachment. It's really about the story that we tell ourselves about our stuff. So when you're in the decluttering process and you can't let go because you're like, well, this was my favorite shirt when I was 10 pounds skinnier, or my grandma gave this to me, or I paid good money for it. You're stuck in a clutter block, right? You're blocked and letting go. But the bigger picture that people need to understand is that we bring the clutter into our house. We buy the stuff because we think the stuff is going to fix something inside of us. We think that, you know, I'm feeling lonely or I'm feeling bad about myself. And if I go shopping, I'll feel better. I mean, I'm guilty of it. The other day I was having a terrible day and I went to Sephora and I was like, eyebrow pencil, that'll <laughs> fix my life. Yeah. You know, so we're, we're looking, we're looking for that. And, and we just want to stop and say this. I'm not telling people not to shop. I'm not telling people not to buy. I love pretty things. I love clothes. I like vintage Gucci purses. Like I like, I'm not saying don't shop. I'm not, that's not my messaging. But I'm saying that we need to have a healthy acquisition cycle. We need to understand if we're buying things that we don't need, we don't love, if we're buying it for the wrong reasons, it's not going to fix us. Right. You mentioned two ways that things come into the house, like things that we buy. And what was the first one again? And things that people give us. Oh, things that people <laughs> give. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you know, we're, it's such a, you know, we are so gifts. It's like this, you know, this person went out of their way to buy this thing for me and it was such a lovely gesture, but I hate it, but I can't get rid of it. You know, we're so wrapped in the guilt about yeah. it. You're laughing because you're like, I, yes, I relate I to that, that so much because I get a lot of gifts, whether it's from people in your life or even like my job as a content creator, I get sent a lot of packages and I just don't know what to do with it. So it just becomes clutter. Um, yeah. So what are your tips on letting go, especially when you have like an emotional attachment? Like, oh, I feel bad because someone gifted this to me. Yeah, I think. Um, you know, so I have two books. My second book is coming out October 4th. It's called Make Space for Happiness. My first book, Making Space Clutter Free, addresses these clutter blocks, these reasons that we can't let go. And in the second book, we really talk about why we're bringing stuff in. So the thing that I invite people to do is really look at like they got to do a little bit of the hard work, Eileen. You like look and see where you feel something's missing in your life. Do you feel guilty? Do you, you know what's this underlying emotion that keeps you attached to the stuff? Because if you remember, stuff comes to us with no meaning, right? You get sent a box of stuff and you're like, why well, didn't even ask for this? 
And I don't even know if I like, you know, CBD coffee. Like I, I, I didn't, but someone went out of their way to send it to me. So I feel like I need to do something with it, right? So it, it shows up on your doorstep and you become attached to it. Um, there's something really interesting too that, it, uh, that I found when I was researching the second book, Make Space for Happiness, was this thing called the specialness spiral. This is so, when I learned this, this was so fascinating. So if you're gifted something or you buy something and you decide, oh, I'm not going to use it right away. I'm going to save, save it for a special time. All of a sudden, this stuff takes this whole new meaning. And then what happens is you don't ever want to use it. Mm-hmm. So that, that dress hangs in your closet with tags on it for, an, you know, and you're like, it's too special. I have to wear it for a special occasion. And so what happens is you get all this stuff in your house that you don't use. Yeah. Yeah. I can relate to that. Well, instead of going, I, I think we should backtrack a little bit. And I want you to talk about your clutter blocks. You said that you have seven emotional clutter blocks. Let's talk about them. What are they? How do we identify them? They're It's great. So they are everything from clutter block number one, which is my stuff keeps me stuck in the past. These are things that remind us of our bygone days, you know, and look, I'm not saying wipe out your memorabilia, wipe out your history, but if your life is full of so much stuff from the past, it's telling you that your best days are behind you. You know, it's not getting you to look forward. And especially, I see this so much with my female clients with clothes that they can't fit into anymore. Life happens. Gravity happens. You can't wear what you used to be able to wear, but they hold on to it because I'm going to get back there someday. Mm -hmm. And then what they're really just doing is having, you know, things that make them feel bad about themselves hanging in their closet. So, you know, that's, that's it. Clutter block number three. This is me. Listeners, full disclosure, it's clutter is avoiding my stuff. I don't like to open my mail. I don't like to, like, I just don't like to deal with the business of being an adult. So I see that so much things, you know, build up. Um, they keep going. You just are like, I got, yeah, I'm not going to deal with it. And then the clutter, the paper clutter builds up. Um, one of my favorite clutter blocks and one of the best ones to break free of is clutter block number five. I'm not worth my good stuff. So it's this feeling that we're not good enough to wear the pretty blouse or to burn the nice candle or to use the china, that we have all this stuff that's special for some day and then not realizing that today's special. Today's special. Wear the nice blouse. Wear it. Feel good. Eat your pizza off china. Like I just, I, you know, this idea of like there's this time and, you know, we're, it's a very different world than even our parents that people don't really set a table anymore. We don't use that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden it's just sitting, you right. know, in your house and then your then your parents pass it along to you and you're like, I don't want it, but it was special to them. And you, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, which is clutter block number seven, stuck with other people's stuff, right? So that it's things that people have gifted you, things that people have um, left to you. You know, you can't, Um, it, it, it's very, it's very, very, very insidious, right? Because it comes with so much emotion, especially if it's somebody who's passed away, Mm -hmm. you know, if it's historical or your family history. And we all have those things. Eileen, I'm sure you have it in your life that something your family's given to you and they're like, this is very important because grandma got it from great grandma. And you're like, but I don't want it. (laughs) (laughs) Let's take a break for today's sponsor, Clinique. I always appreciate when a product is clinically tested to be effective, which is why I'm excited to partner with Clinique. Meet Clinique's first foundation designed to be the last step in your skincare routine. Even better, Clinical Serum Foundation is formulated with three serum technologies that visibly reduce dark spots, brighten, and hydrate the skin. I personally love when makeup can double as skincare, and that's exactly what this product is. Foundation doesn't do it justice. This is Clinical Foundation, built with three serum technologies and it even gives UV protection. Available in 42 shades, this hydrating foundation formula provides buildable, medium to full coverage with a satin finish. In as little as eight weeks, skin appears more even toned, radiant, and smoother even after makeup is removed. 
Plus, the glass bottle is recyclable with this more sustainable packaging. Don't call it makeup. This is skincare in just your shade. Find your shade this holiday season at Clinique.com. So in order to move through each of these clutter blocks, is it the same strategy or is it really like a different tactic for each one because they're so different? Yeah, I think it's a combination. I think at the baseline, it's the same in that acknowledging. Like that's the first step to acknowledge and say like, oh, okay, this isn't just, I'm not just lazy or I'm not just a bad housekeeper. Like I have all these stories. And once you realize that it's just a story, you can untell it to yourself. Mm -hmm. But also a lot of things that I talk about in both books is finding finding something to do that doesn't revolve around the stuff. For example, my mother is 80 and in great health and, you know, doing great. She doesn't need any more stuff. Every time I go see her, she gives me stuff, gives it, take it away. She gives it to my niece, so, you know. And what I realized is gifts for her now, she wants to see us. Mm, That's what she wants to do. Yeah. She'd rather I spent that money on a plane ticket to spend time with her than to buy her another scarf that she doesn't need, <laughs> yeah. you know? So I think it's, un and here like, I, my mom wants me to come visit too. <laughs> so I think it's a, identifying it and understanding where it comes from and then seeing what you can do to replace it. Mm, I see. It's so, so I get what you're saying. It's being aware of the emotion that's that the emotion that matters, like what is it that you're attached to or like what is the emotion behind the gift? Like it doesn't have to be the physical thing. It could be just showing up and spending t quality time with someone. Exactly, exactly. Figuring out the emotional hold it has on you and then you can break free of it. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm sure even being aware of the emotion and the story, sometimes it is still hard for your clients to let go, <laughs> right? So how how do you untangle? Like, is there a process to like let go of this? For example, like a historic artifact from your family that you don't want, but it holds so much story and emotion. Like, how do you untangle something like that? That, uh, it's so great. That's so great. I love this. So one of the things that I discovered, I've been in business for 15 years. I own a, in addition to being an author, I own a professional decluttering company and I've been doing this for 15 years. And what I found is that if you are super attached to something, I'll give a perfect example in your real time. You as a content creator get shipped a bunch of stuff and I'm going to imagine a ton of skincare and makeup mm -hmm. and <laughs> you know that a lot yeah. of that stuff comes your way. And you're like, I don't want, I can't. If I said to you, look, I'm going to swing by your house. I'm taking all this stuff to a, a shelter for you know survivors of domestic violence had to leave in the middle of the night. You would be, you'd be like, here, take it all. Take it all. Like I can help someone with this stuff. So if it's hard for you to let go, find a place to donate. Even if it's your babysitter or your best friend, find a personal connection because our kindness is going to, our kindness and generosity is going to outweigh our attachment. So you, you'll be like, I, I, you know, right? Like, I, I don't want this stuff, but I don't want to throw it away. And these companies send it to me. Oh, you mean I can give it to someone who needs it and uses it? So that's one way. And with things that are historic artifacts, I just had this conversation on Instagram um, about yearbooks, high school yearbooks. Do we want them? Do we need them? I've never looked at mine again. And then somebody told me that Ancestry.com is collecting all yearbooks to like do all. And so it's like, so sometimes with this historical thing, it's finding an organization or your family, you know, a church or so, there's somebody's looking for that stuff. And sometimes once you get through all that, sometimes what's historical is just a family story. It's just right. a family lore, yeah. you know, and it's really not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, so it's, it's, it's understanding the story and then unpacking it. Yeah. Um, this kind of leads me to the next question because I think a lot of what blocks people, at least what blocks me during decluttering is number one is like making the effort. Like you, sometimes you know you don't want this stuff, but like it's the effort of like doing it. And then the second part is what keeps me from doing it is I don't know where all these 
things could go. Yeah, sure, I can donate clothes, but what about broken electronics or like large items? How do I get rid of something large? Um, and, and then I, a part of me feels bad for the environment as well for like throwing so much stuff in the trash. Like I wish there was some like an automatic thing where all my tra- someone sh- would sort it to the right place, <laughs> right? But it, it's, there's like a lot of effort into putting, you know. I think that's great. I think the the first part that you talked about is understanding that it takes effort. Like, especially if you're busy, like, and you don't like it. So sometimes do you need a friend to come over? Do you need to hire someone? Like sometimes you just need extra help. I, I give this example all the time. I don't like cleaning my house. I can do <laughs> it, but I don't enjoy it. And I, I just, and but I want to clean house. I've hired an absolutely lovely woman. I'm so happy when she shows up. It's, I'm in a place where I can afford it. It's great. I don't, even though I know I can. So sometimes if you need help with decluttering, sometimes declutter with a buddy, like I'll come to your closet, you come do mine. And then, you know, it takes a little bit of work. And I think you're right. We want to keep this stuff out of the landfill. Um, I just had a call, which I'm super excited about because they're coming to Southern California, but this company called Ridwell where they give you these boxes, you pay a really small fee a month and you put everything that's recyclable in them and they come twice a month and pick them up. Oh, I just had a call with them. Yeah. I was like, you know, but I was like, define recyclable, you. like the typical recyclables or just yeah, like, no, they batteries, oh. eyeglasses, soft plastics. Oh. Um, every month they do a specialized pickup. So like last month they set up in Portland, they did, um, pet toys and dog, you know, pet food and dog toys. So they did, worked with the Humane Society. So, you know, I think we're, I'm hoping my fingers are crossed that we're starting to see, you know, th- people are realizing that people like you and I, we want to do the right thing and we right. don't want to throw it away. And I think people are coming to that realization and starting to offer that service. But, you know, it is hard. You're, I know, but you're right. You're like, I, I don't want to throw it all in the trash, but I'm going to drive around to 10 places. <laughs> like, I don't even know where some of these things should go. I, I think it's as a culture, as a society, like consuming and shopping is so common. It's so common. Everyone shops, but is it like, we don't have like an exit system, <laughs> like outside of just the trash and barely recycling, but we don't even know how to recycle. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean. So we just keep buying and buying and we don't even know how to get rid of things. And, and that's such the, that's the really, that's what made me write my second book, which comes out on October 4th, Make Space for Happiness, is that we, especially during the pandemic, we were just shopping, 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 shopping. And, you know, we don't, when we think about clutter, the conversation's always been about decluttering. But I'm like, what about bringing the clutter in? Mm-hmm. What are you, what are you doing? Like, what are you shopping? What are you buying? Like, what are you trying to fill in yourself by, by that? Like what's missing in your life that you think, you know, I give this example, like, you know, the parents who work all the time and feel guilty about how much they work and they buy their kid every new toy. I see that all the time, you know, that they're, that we're trying to fill something. And so one of the things I break down in the book is what are you trying to fill by shopping and how can you fulfill it some other way? Mm, I love that. Yeah. Um, Okay. So since you mentioned your book, let's talk about, like, tell us more about this book. What, how is it different from your first book and what excites you about it? It's so exciting. So the, so this book, I realized, especially during the pandemic, I was like, we, in the same way we tell these stories about the things that we can't let go of. In this book, we tell ourselves these stories about why we need to buy. And I call them the clutter magnets. And the way I describe it, it's like you have this little hole inside yourself and you're like, oh, if I buy this sweater, I'll get, you know, self-respect. Or if I buy the right lipstick, I'll get self-confidence. Or if I buy all these gadgets, I'm going to save time. That we have these seven clutter magnets that we're trying to fill with the stuff and the stuff doesn't ever fill it. And again, I love a pretty sweater. I do, but I'm not going to get the same fulfillment from spending an afternoon with my best girlfriend. You know, that the stuff is not the substitute for true connection or real love or purpose. You know, one Mm -hmm. of the things that 
I, I suggest to my clients who live, you know, who shop a lot, a lot when it's getting out of control or shopping when they can't afford is go volunteer, go be of service, go, go help someone and you'll realize how much you have in your own life and that you'll get so much more fulfillment. You'll get so much more fulfillment that you won't be, you know, shopping the sales all the time. Yeah. I think some people, it's just, it, it's also too easy. It's in front of you. You get like a notification, this is on sale. And so that's, it's how they really just spend their time. But it is true. Like we get our sense of fulfillment from other things, like true connection with your other humans, <laughs> whether it's volunteering or just spending time with your friends. Exactly. I mean, and I said this the other day to somebody, because again, I get the, you know, you get these emails with the sun sale on sale. I'm like, if everything's on sale, nothing's on sale. Like, what does a sale mean anymore? You know, and so yeah. we get we get locked in. And also I think we forget, you know, we forget how much we're marketed to, right? We forget that it's happening all the time and we're sort of losing our sense of all that. And um, I did a lot of research for this book about the science of happiness. You know, how do we raise our happiness? And and one of the things that every study kept going back to is that it's four things. Exercise, and it doesn't even have to be, you know, running an ultra marathon. Oh, you know, 10,000 steps with your best friend. It's exercise. It's being of service to someone else. It's a gratitude practice or counting your blessings. And it's spending time with people that you love. That's mm -hmm. one of the, connecting with the people you love is one of the long, if you have a very strong social um, network and a lot of, you know, good friends, that's one of the biggest indicators of longevity in life. Yeah, I believe that. I think I did. We we had another guest on the podcast talk about this topic because she studied like, I think they're called centarians, like people who live the longest and, and what were the patterns of what gave them that longevity. And yes, it was their sense of community and spending time with people they love. You think about when you feel so refreshed, you know, you go shopping and you buy something and it looks perfect and pretty in the store and you get a hit of dopamine. And I hit a dopamine in the last like 17 seconds. So then you're like, well, I need to shop again to get it. Yeah. I need to shop again to get it. But then you think about it, you spend an afternoon with a dear friend. The next morning you're waking up still thinking about it or laughing about the jokes. You feel good. And so I think that people need to understand what they're trying to fix with the shopping. And it's not working. Because we keep shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. It's It takes some self-reflection and just to like recognize like this is a temporary gratification, kind of like scrolling on Instagram. It's that like one second of dopamine that you get. That's what you're also feeling when you're shopping. So how are the ways that you can find fulfillment that are deeper and longer lasting? Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the things in the immediate um, that I tell people, and this is such a great, like you can start this right now. Stop in terms of shopping and buying, stop saying, I need, I need a new pair of jeans. I need a new pair of leggings. 99% of the time, you don't, you probably have plenty of leggings. You probably have plenty of jeans. Swap the word need for the word want. I want a new pair of jeans. I want a new pair of leggings. Great. You want a new pair of jeans. Fantastic. But the minute you take need out, it loses its power and its grip on you, mm -hmm. right? You don't yeah. need it. You're not on the hunt for it. You're like, I want a new pair of jeans. Maybe you find them, maybe you don't. And people have made that, just that vocabulary switch. And it is immediate, like immediate. They're like, oh, I don't even, I don't even, no, I don't even want it anymore. So I think it's, it's an awareness. It's an understanding that there's something else that you're trying to fix and and how can you get that someplace else? You know, I, I do an exercise in the book um, and I say, you know, I just say, pick up, you know, think of someone in your life that has passed away. I always think of my grandmother. She was my best friend. You know, I, it's been 20 years. I still miss her every day. And, I, and then, and I say, oh, imagine they come back for one day. You get them back in this earth for one day. What, how would you spend the day? 
no one's going to go shopping. I'm not going to take my grandma to the dollar store. I want to sit at the kitchen table and have a cup of tea and ask her all the questions I never got to ask her. And so when you realize that when someone precious is with you, you're not going to go shopping with them, then you start to realize, oh, this is just an activity. It's not a fixer. Yeah, definitely. And don't get me started on the expression (laughs) retail therapy. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) No, I I think we understand your messaging on that. Like be intentional if like when you shop and it's it's not I need, it's it's I want, but fulfillment is found outside of that. No, I just I just think that we I think we all realized during the pandemic and the lockdown, and I know we're sick of talking about it, but when we lost our connection, right? When we weren't seeing people that, you know, we were all over buying. We were all over buying. Yeah, definitely. Um, So now I'm curious about when you're working with clients to help them declutter their homes, do you have like a recommended process? Like what's your strategy? How do you start? That's great. So the first place that I start with everybody is why. Why do you want to get decluttered? Start there and it, and and have them figured out. And the really important thing is that I want it to be a positive why. So I don't want it to be I'm a bad housekeeper, I'm lazy. No, I you know I want to host Thanksgiving. I want to host my friend's surprise birthday party. I want to be able to get dressed in the morning without my closet being a disaster and starting the day in tears. Because once you figure out the why, that's what's going to keep you motivated. Mm right? That's going to keep you going because you're going to go for a positive feeling. Then the next thing is you need to schedule the time in. You need to make a date with yourself because if you're not, you know, I'll wake up and declutter it any day, but if it's not your natural inclination, then you need to plan. Like I'm going to give two hours on Saturday and be realistic about your time. If you don't like to do it, don't schedule eight hours, an hour, two hours. And start small, start really small. One drawer in your bathroom, you know, two shelves in your linen closet. Like don't pull your whole closet out and try and go through that. And, you know, start small, be successful, you know, see how good that feels and then build on that success. And then you're like, oh, two drawers feels great. Three drawers are going to feel even better. It's all about focusing on the positive outcome. Yeah. I love that. Okay. And then beyond that, like, do you have a strategy for like how to declutter, like say a drawer? Like, yeah. So it's just, it's so simple, sort of, but it's, you just pull it out and you put like with like, that's the first step you put all, let's say, let's say you're doing, let's say you're doing a drawer in your bathroom that has makeup, right? All the eyeliners together, all the blushes together, all the, you know, all like categories. And the reason that you do that is that one, it shows you how much you have of one category. And then also you're not doing that thing where you're like, is this, do I need this? Do I have a blush? Where's an, I like a that color, but mm-hmm. you know, you can see it in front of yourself and you can refer back to it. Um, and this is also really important um, for people with ADHD. Interesting thing about ADHD is people who have ADHD can sequence forward. So that's why they're always moving on to the next next task. People who are good multitaskers are actually good sequencers back and forth, back and forth. So if, some, if ADHD is something that you're dealing with, keeping it small and keeping it with categories is you're like, all right, I'm looking at all my lipsticks. I'm looking at all my blushes. I'm looking, you know, you can make those decisions and it's, and then have a trash bag, have a recycle bin and have a donate bag so that you, you know, you have a place to put it and you've got to see. And that's another reason I lean about starting small is you need to see it all the way through. So if you take on too big of a project, you're going to like halfway through and be like, oh, I'm just tired of this. Right. <laughs> right. It's too overwhelming. Okay. What about, um, like, do you work with people on like redesigning, like where they put things? Cause a lot of the times, like things aren't as, you know, effectively designed, if that makes sense. So how how do you even start to, you know, reorganize the cabinets where things go? Because some people like they'll have a little bit of things everywhere, right? Yeah. 
exact, I do a ton of spatial work and, you know, really, and this is where that, that organizing tenant of like with light comes in. Like, you know, you, you have all your band-aids together, have your first aid together because what it does, you know, people will say, well, you're just so OCD. I mean, I do have OCD, but you know, it's, and it's like, no, no, no. If it's all together, if all my hair ties are in the same place, whenever I need a hair tie, I know where to go. So what you're really doing by setting things up and putting like with like is setting up systems. Because what you don't want to have to think about is where are my hair ties? Why do I not have a hair tie? It's like, oh, I always know they're in this little container in the drawer. And the other side of that, which helps you really stay on top of the clutter, is that when you're cleaning up, you know exactly where to put it when you go home. When yeah. it's time to put it away, that, right? That's huge. You're like, oh, this is where this lives. It's so small, but <laughs> it's, it's actually huge. so huge. Like to know where to put things back. Like I like to have everything has a home, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 And that is, it's, it's exactly what you said. It's so simple, but it's huge. And what it also does is it takes the guesswork. You're not reinventing the wheel. Where does this live? Where do I put this? It's like, oh, this lives in the second drawer. I put it away. I'm done. And I can go on and live my life and I can go do fun things. I like bins. I like to or you know, organize into containers. There's a very big movement right now of the extreme where everything's labeled and everything matches in bins. And you know, it looks great. It's a lot of upkeep. And if you love to do that, great. But for most of us. I don't want to spend the time. It's not, you know, I am, I know where things go. I put them, it's not for everyone. And I want to, you know, if it's not for you, then great, great. Another problem that I feel like I've experienced in my life is like when you, when you do bring new things in, whether it's a gift or you bought it, sometimes like it, because it's new, it doesn't have a home. And then because you feel like your shelves or cabinets are full there, you don't even know, like it just ends up on the counter. Like, like this new thing is now on the counter <laughs> or like, you know, my boyfriend brings home like a new pen from work every day. And it's just like, so, so what is your advice on that? That's great. So, you know, especially I do this with myself with clothes, one thing in, one thing out, one thing in, one thing out, you know? So if you're mm-hmm. bringing it, things in and especially if you're a state where your cupboards are full and you don't have a Oh, let's just say coffee mugs. You get a new coffee mug and you're like, I love this coffee mug and it's the right size and it's so cute. <laughs> like there's no more space can't, for it. <laughs> right. Then it, you're like, I, I got to declutter. I got to let something go. If I really want this new thing, I've got to let something else go. Because you, we live in the space that we live in. This is how much space we have. Clients say to me and people say to me all the time, well, I just need a bigger house. And I'm like, well, you're just going to fill that up too. Like, you know, you're just gonna, a bigger space. So it's understanding the space that you live in. And this is how much I have to store. Right. Um, are you a believer that we have to declutter, like say once a year or, or is this like, I guess, how often do you think people should be decluttering or do you believe once you have a system, it's going to always work? <laughs> Yeah, no, yes, that I do not believe because new stuff is constantly coming in. I think that we need a race. You know, you're going to, holidays are coming up. You're going to get new stuff. You know, I think that decluttering needs to become a regular practice. I, I think it's, you know, the, the thing that I tell people is if it takes you more than 20 minutes to tidy a room up, to kind of get it back to looking at, you know, if you're spending sort of an hour cleaning your closet or putting away, you need to declutter. You should be able to put every room back together in 20 minutes. Mm. So, you know, I, I think we need a regular decluttering practice every couple of weeks, once a month, you know, because there's a difference. This is interesting. There's a difference between decluttering, organizing, and cleaning. There are three separate tasks. Decluttering is letting go and getting rid of and making space. Organizing is deciding where things live in a home and cleaning is cleaning. And so I think where people get overwhelmed is that they try and do all three at the same time. So it's it's understanding that those are separate tasks. And, you know, if you clean once a week and then you organize a little less and then you declutter a little less. So it's it's understanding that they're three important 
tasks in your home, but they're separate. Yeah. So what is your personal like habit and routine? How often are you doing those three things? So one of the things that, well, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm very lucky. I have some lovely lady that comes and cleans my house every week. So I love her. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I live by is I don't put things down, put them away. So I work very hard. The thing I focus on in terms of organizing, my house is organized. The systems are in place from when I moved in, but I make sure that everything gets put away. I try not to go to bed till everything's returned to its home. So when mm. that happens, I wake up in the morning to an organized house. So that's a really big one. Can you put everything away at the end of the night? And then decluttering, you know, I, I, I probably, I'll hit a space like the drawer will get a little full or the linen closet. And I'm like, I need to declutter. I'm going to spend an hour this weekend. So I, you know, I have a constant practice of it. So I probably, I probably do, I probably focus on decluttering once a month, one area of my house. So yeah. Yeah, that sounds pretty doable, actually. It's more once you have an organized system, then you just follow the system and and decluttering is more just the upkeep, right? Let's. How about you give us tips on how to create an organized system? Oh, I, great. So first of all, the first, first thing is if you're getting started on your decluttering and organizing journey, do not run out and buy every bin that you can see. Don't, don't start there. The first step is always declutter. Then realize what you already have because chances are you've probably bought all those bins and baskets already. So it's finding out, um, you know, it's finding out what works in your space, making sure you measure, buying the, if you're going to buy and buy the right things. Um, the other big organizing tip, it's so silly. Adjust move adjustable shelves. If you have adjustable shelves, move them, make them the right height, you know, get yourself more space. Like I go into so many people houses where they move in. I'm like, well, you got move the shelf. And they're like, can I do that? I'm like, yes, it's your house. So there are some really simple, you know, some (laughs) simple things that you can do and also acknowledge maybe, you know, do you have the right piece of furniture? Do you, do you have a lot of books and you don't have a big enough bookshelf? Do you need them? You know, do you need a piece of furniture? Because a lot of times I see in people's homes when things get out of control is that they might be missing a piece of furniture. Like they might be missing, um, you know, a lot. This is, comes up all the time with houses that are shoe free, you know, people that are shoe free and, or they just made their house shoe free. Every time somebody has a baby, they're like, no more shoes in my house great, but they don't figure out what to do with all the shoes. So then the whole hallway. So it's, you know, back cute baskets or a bench. Is there something that you can do? So it's about thinking about how you live and how you use your space. Okay. What about teaching like tips for getting everyone who lives in the home (laughs) with the system, right? Because the one who's leading is obviously going to know the rules and everything. So (laughs) what are your tact because I, I have a boyfriend who's kind of messy. So how do you teach other people? What, what are your tips on that? Getting everyone on board. This is great. I also have a messy boyfriend. So, uh, you know, the, the, the first thing I always tell people is start with a positive conversation because usually when someone's messy, they've heard it their whole life. You know, you're about, you're messy, you're lazy, you know, they've heard all this stuff. So automatically when you start to talk about it, they're going to tighten up and they're going to shut down. So I always say, talk about what we are going to benefit. Mm-hmm. What's it, how is this going to make our house better? It means that if we put a cute bowl on the table in the entryway and every night our keys go in there, that means that tomorrow morning, you don't have to run around looking for your keys. Like focus on the positive of what you'll gain as a household with that. And then sometimes, like in my house, you have to give the person their own space that they can be messy and you just don't go in there. Sometimes that has to happen. <laughs> you know, but I think, I mean, I really okay. think it's about, um, it's about focusing on the positive and, and what the whole house will gain. What instead of you feel bad and you're wrong and you're messy, 
Yeah. Yeah. Cause in that case, I feel like it does like make that person tighten up. And I think the reality is the people who are messy, like maybe they just weren't taught to have organized habits because they grew up in a messy household. So it's not that they're lazy or they're, it's not intentional. Sometimes it's just a matter of habit. Absolutely. And you know, I, I, I use this example all the time, like not everyone was born to play the violin. Like some people are talented or play the piano and other people had to take lessons. Like if you, if you weren't raised that way, or if you're not naturally in life, get some help. It's okay. Like we all can't be good at everything. I think right now there's such this culture of like, we have to be able to do everything. And I, and it, that's not the case. Like, and if you need help, you need help. And if you need to learn, great. That's great. But I do know sometimes those of us who do live with a messy person, you're like, yes, clean your stuff up. I know. (laughs) It's just helping them build those habits. And it's like, it's, yeah, it's a process. (laughs) Yeah, it's a process. But I I, I think it goes back to you focus on the positive. Yes. Okay. Um, You also talk about, you know, decluttering every other area of your life, not just physical things. Like you mentioned, like decluttering your finances. And so can you touch on maybe some, I guess, what you're most interested in teaching people outside of decluttering physical stuff? Like what else is there? Absolutely. Um, Like finances are such a great, you know, we just think like, is your will in order? Is your, you know, are you... One of the greatest ways to declutter your finances, did you move everything digital and put it on auto pay? Auto pay changed my life. I just, yeah. everything's paid and it's off and it's great. Like all of a sudden. So are there some things, there's so many supports out there to do that. And, you know, do you need a better accountant? Do you, you know, really taking, because here's the thing, especially about finances and if they're cluttered and if they're messy and you don't know how many bank accounts you have or what credit cards, it lives in your brain all the time. You you pretend you're ignoring it, but you're not. And so getting control of that is amazing. Um, mm-hmm. A big thing, it's a huge job, but it's so satisfying is decluttering and organizing photos. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because everything's digital now as well. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I was taken now to one of the things I do for myself when I'm on a plane, I go through and, you know, and I'm just, there's no movie or whatever. I just go through and delete photos off my phone Mm, and I I can delete a couple hundred photos, you know, in a half an hour on a flight. You're like, oh, I didn't, there's, you know, because you look at your phone and you have, 10 pictures of the same, of this, two, yes. you know, ten, yeah. you know, you're like, I don't need all these. I don't need all these. So photos are great, you know, thing. And sometimes we have to declutter our activities. Like, are you too booked up? Are you trying too many things? Are you signed up for 16 different classes? Like time is so precious. Where are you spending it? Where are you spending your time? Right, right. It's so true. I I love this, like applying this concept of decluttering to every area of your life. Like what are the things that you don't need that you can let go of? And yeah, talking about the, I feel like photos and videos on your phone is a huge one that everyone can relate to. Oh my goodness. It's almost like each year I have to get a bigger and bigger memory space because I have so much, so, so much content. I know it's amazing. And, you know, and, 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 and especially photos, I, I've started doing this for people when I, like if I go on a trip with somebody or we do, you know, I'll make a photo book of the weekend and send it to them as a gift. And it's so lovely. And you and then you actually look at the photos, you grab the book and you look at it. So, uh, you know, I think that when you, when you start to declutter your home, you start to see the other areas of your life. Like, oh, maybe. Maybe I don't need that person in my life anymore. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah. I I, I love that. Even me, I, something that I learned in the past year is like, I am actually very, like my environment influences me and how I feel. So the more clutter there is, the more my mind feels so cluttered and messy. And which is why sometimes I just get in the mood, like, okay, I need to get rid of so many, I I need a clear space. I want to feel peace in my home. So I'm excited to, to put these tips into practice this weekend. (laughs) 
Oh, great. And you know, that feeling too of the cluttered home, uh, the thing is, it's been scientifically proven. You feel it because it's true. Like our brains can only process so much and and living in a cluttered home increases your stress. Yeah. They've proven it. It's yeah. it's not, we're not just telling you this to look cute on Pinterest. Like it, it really stresses you out. Yeah. And so the less clutter that you can have, the less stress you're going to feel. <laughs> that should be enough reason to for everyone to go declutter their homes. Um, okay, Tracy, what is the most important insight that you want to leave our audience with today? That the stuff will not fix you. Yeah. Dig deeper because it's it's beyond that. Yep. That I think if anything, the stuff will not fix you. Mm. Amazing. And where can we find you online? Excellent. So my website is Tracy McCubbin, M-C-C-U-B-B-I-N dot com. Lots of fun stuff. And then Instagram is my big platform. We're having a ton of fun. I do these really fun five five minute decluttering challenges and we're just having a lot of fun. So yeah. I love that. Like decluttering just for five minutes. I've been into like just doing five minutes of a habit because it's so doable. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I I hit on it. I just said it one day about, actually, we started with coffee mugs and yeah. it blew up and mm. everyone was like, I want more. So yesterday we did bathing suits and shorts and I just pick a little category, five minutes. And and the great thing is now we've, I, think, I don't know, we've done 60 of them so far or something. Wow. And the great thing is that people keep DMing me and say, I've done my whole house now. I couldn't do it. And all of a sudden, five minutes, my whole house is decluttered. So they're, they're, they're super fun. And if you, you know, if you need a little, like I can, and you can do almost anything for five minutes, right? So you're like, okay, five minutes. So that's happening over on Instagram and we're having so much fun with it. Oh, I love that so much. Thanks for sharing that. Cause I'm sure everyone's like, oh, a category like bathing suits. I can do that. Like it's so small. It's so doable. It's, you don't have to do your whole house in a day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's my whole goal is that I want to increase people's happiness and I want this to be easy. I know it's hard for a lot of people. So whatever we can do to make it a little bit easier, that's what I want. Love it. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your insight, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs> 